my name is Raymond Burr. With your help, we'll make it happen. The year is 1942, and the Second World War rages on. In BC, support for the war effort is ongoing, with women playing an increasing role in the workplace. Even during this time of global struggle, the important work of the board was still needed. Men and women were still being injured on the job. But the system wasn't without its critics. In 1941, the government called for and established the first Royal Commission to review the Workmen's Compensation Act. The commission was headed by Chief Justice Gordon McGregor Sloan. The objective was to consider and recommend amendments to the act to make it more relevant and reflective of the times. The following year, in 1942, Chief Justice Sloan's report was released. Many proposals for amendments to the text of the act were received. The report of the commission recommends the acceptance of the majority of these proposals. Chief Justice Gordon McGregor Sloan. The report provided recommendations that impacted every department of the board it was a major milestone in the organization's development. In 1942, the WCB opened its first rehabilitation center in Vancouver to treat injured workers. By the end of the facility's first year, an average of 262 workers were being treated daily at the center. The following year, the board established a vocational rehabilitation department to assist permanently injured workers in returning to productive employment. In 1944, the board issued a directive that all safety committees must have equal representation for management and labor. This marked the beginning of formalized joint health and safety committees in BC. Recognizing the value of visual aids in accident prevention, the board embarked on a program of visual education. New equipment was purchased, including still cameras, film projectors, and equipment for photo developing and enlarging. The board's first films produced in-house covered logging and sawmilling safety. Other films followed, and the board's information and education department continued to grow over the coming decades. In 1946, the Workmen's Compensation Act was amended to include coverage for workers in hotels, nursing homes, dental laboratories, landscape companies, auction houses, beauty parlors, barber shops, and companies servicing automatic music machines. The post-war years were a boom time for BC, with large infrastructure projects across the province creating thousands of new jobs. With all this industrial activity came an increase in claims, and by 1947, the board received its one millionth reported injury. The board was growing and moved into a new head office located on West 37th Avenue in Vancouver. In 1949, the government launched a second royal commission looking at ways to strengthen the Workmen's Compensation Act. 
The commission was again headed by Chief Justice Sloan and heard from many parties. This testimony, running to approximately seven million words, together with the arguments of counsel and others, is recorded in 22,982 pages of transcript. Chief Justice Gordon McGregor Sloan. One focus of the commission, among others, was to consider the board's record of providing prevention leadership and resources to industry and workers. Chief Justice Sloan's findings, which came out in 1952, confirmed that the board had indeed been effectively leading prevention initiatives since its inception in 1917. I have reached the conclusion that in this phase of accident prevention, the board has demonstrated a praiseworthy, conscientious, and intelligent devotion to its obligation. Chief Justice Gordon McGregor Sloan. Following the Royal Commission, the act was further amended and the compensation rate was increased to 70% of gross wages. The compensation rate had started at 55% in 1917, increased to 62.5% in 1923, and increased again to 66% in 1939. It would increase again to 75% in 1954. In 1955, in response to the board's growing focus on worker rehabilitation, a new rehabilitation center opened next to the board's head office in Vancouver. In 1956, the board passed regulations that all workers exposed to serious drowning risk must wear life jackets. As the summer of 1958 approached, the board was about to be faced with responding to one of the largest industrial incidents in BC's history. The date, June 17, 1958. All at once we heard a great big bang, just like a rifle shot. We can hear this loud sound, bang, 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 all the time when was shooting. And it was bolts coming out of the, of the splices, breaking off in half. Bands four and five of Vancouver's second Narrows Bridge plunged into the waters of Burrard Inlet this afternoon with a tremendous hiss and a terrible loss of life. The tragic collapse of the Iron Workers Memorial Bridge was a major event in BC's labor history, and one that is still remembered and honored today. Many today have never heard the name Beatrice Zuko, but if you worked at the board in the late 1950s, you probably had. Beatrice Zuko was the wife of a miner denied a silicosis pension by the board. In 1956, she staged a one-day protest with three of her young children outside the board's head office. The protest garnered front-page newspaper coverage throughout BC. She then moved her protest to the steps of the BC legislature. When this was unsuccessful, she petitioned the provincial cabinet to pass a law giving her husband special permission to sue the board for a silicosis pension. Her request was denied, despite wide public support for her position. In 1959, the government introduced an extensive package of legislative amendments. The changes were intended to give the board more statutory latitude and to give injured workers the benefit of the doubt in cases of industrial injuries. Beatrice Zuko was now able to receive a widow's pension, her husband having sadly died in the intervening years. In 1962, the government announced a third Royal Commission looking into the Workmen's Compensation Act. The Commission's findings were released by Justice Charles Tyso in late 1965 and covered almost 500 pages of reporting and recommendations. 
As part of his report, Justice Tyso voiced his general support for the act. I am persuaded that in fundamentals, no better general scheme or plan of workmen's compensation exists than that which is embodied in the Workmen's Compensation Act of British Columbia. Indeed, no one who has appeared before this inquiry has suggested the contrary. Justice Charles Heiser. As with the previous commissions, changes to the act were recommended. In a groundbreaking move, benefits and allowances were now tied to the cost of living rather than paid as set amounts. In 1964, the board improved the administration of workers' compensation by moving some of the paper-based files to a large mainframe computer system. A new data center was established, housing a Univac computer, state-of-the-art for its day. The quarter century covering 1942 to 1966 was turbulent for the board. The organization faced not one, not two, but three royal commissions. The act upon which the WCB is based proved to be a dynamic document that could change with the times. The coming quarter century would be one of social, political, and cultural upheaval. The workplace would continue to evolve to fit a changing world and changing social norms. Join us next time for the third quarter century of the Workers' Compensation Board, 1967 to 1991. This message from the Workers' Compensation Board of British Columbia.